my name is Ted Geyer. I am the Vice President and Director of Economic Studies here at Brookings, and I am delighted today that we are hosting Raj Chetty to discuss his most recent paper on lost Einsteins. Uh, I actually have a little personal Raj Chetty story. I didn't share it with him right before when we were, when we were chatting. So I've been in this uh, role for four years. I like my job, I should say. And right after I got the promotion, I was invited to a, a Brookings board meeting. And uh, one of the co-chairs, then co-chairs of our board, I later learned has a tendency to do this. I didn't know it at the time. He cold calls me. So it's my first board meeting. Cold calls me. And he says, I'm wondering, what's the most influential economics article in the last few years? So, you know, the mind races a little bit under those circumstances. It was a totally fair question. Uh, I, I am kind of the vice president of economic studies. I should be able to answer that question. Uh, so what felt like a long delay, and then boom, I came up with Raj Chetty. So you can imagine the next moment of panic, because then you have to figure out which Raj Chetty study <laughs> is the most influential study in the past few years, which is a very, very challenging uh, task. So I don't remember what I answered that day. I will list some of my favorites, uh, and maybe we can have a little like pool or something to figure out uh, which one wins. Uh, he's got a fantastic paper on absolute mobility, where he shows that over the last half decade, the likelihood of a child earning more than their parent at the age of 30 has steadily diminished. I sometimes do these uh, talks on the state of the economy, and I think I labeled this the most dispiriting slide of the year, sometimes labeled the fading of the American dream. He has a paper or papers on relative mobility, showing that the probability that a child born at the bottom of the distribution, income distribution, will rise to the top of the distribution, has been that probability has been relatively flat, again, over many, many decades. Uh, he's got a few papers on the effect of location on economic outcomes, showing that children who move to better neighborhoods improve their economic outcomes in proportion to the amount of time they spend in their childhood in those better neighborhoods. He's done path-breaking work on the impact of teachers on later student outcomes on the optimal level and duration of unemployment insurance, a paper that he presented here, which I was just telling him was one of my favorite presentations, uh, was on uh, uh, the difference between subsidizing savings versus uh, behavioral elements to promote passive, uh, passive behavioral elements to promote uh, savings, the latter being more effective. <laughs> and then an oldie but a goodie, Adam Looney is somewhere here. Uh, uh, Adam Looney is a co-author, or colleague of mine, a co-author of him, of uh, Raj's, on a paper on tax salience, which is just a fantastic paper, I think around 2008, uh, basically showing, I, I've written a public finance book, basically showing my book is wrong. Uh, so thank you. Uh, in that paper, looking at the difference between if you levy a tax and you put it on, you actually include the tax in the ticket price when you go to the shelf as opposed to you include it when it gets rung up the register, you get very different consumer responses. Again, violating the basic principles we held in public finance. Uh, there are two things in particular I want to point out that I appreciate about Raj and his work. One is he's disabused me of this long-held notion that I had. In the 1990s and 2000s in the economics profession, there was this very healthy development, this really meticulous focus on issues of research design, what we call identification. And it really got us thinking about how best can we try to obtain credible em empirical evidence? How do we know if we're actually presenting evidence that might not be that credible? Uh, and it really, gave, it really enhanced the conversation about the em empirical validity of what we were arguing. The, the, the claim that I used to make that he's disabused me of is, unfortunately, I felt, which I think was true, that the better the research design, the narrower the question. And so you often found yourself having really, really, really good research designs, very credible uh, estimates on questions that, you know, some people might care about but aren't of uh, great importance. Well, he's blown that out of the water, combining this dedication to meticulous research design, credible empirical evidence, but yet using large enough data sets and, large and, and fabulous techniques in order to get uh, at really important questions of the day. The second thing I appreciate about Raj I alluded to before is I feel he understands the importance of exposing his work to, uh, uh, to policy experts and to audiences like this. He's spoken here before Brookings. He's sharing his work with us today, and I think that's uh, uh, something to be emulated. So today, I'm grateful that he's here to talk about his latest paper on lost Einsteins, which, uh, along with his co-authors, uh, they examine the disparities in innovation rates by socioeconomic class, race, and gender. So the plan is to have Raj talk for about a half hour, 
Then my colleague Richard Reeves will lead a panel discussion up here. And as we do at Brookings, we will welcome your questions and have a Q&A period to follow. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Raj Chetty. Thanks so much, Ted, for the really thoughtful and generous introduction. And thank you all for being here. Before I start, I just wanted to thank Brookings as well for hosting these events. We've done a couple of these at the Quality of Opportunity Project here at Brookings and have really felt the impact that these events have on translating the research into the public debate. So I appreciate your, your doing this. So the topic I'm going to talk about today really starts from a very simple motivation, very simple question. How can we increase innovation and growth in America? Innovation, as you all know, is widely viewed as the engine of economic growth uh, by, by many people. And so motivated by that, there are people who have talked for a long time about how we can increase rates of innovation. There are many policies we implement with that goal in mind, ranging from investments in STEM education to tax incentives, you know, R&D tax credits for firms or tax cuts for individuals trying to spur more innovation, spur more entrepreneurship. Now, the effectiveness of these policies is widely debated. In the latest tax reform bill being one example, will cutting top tax rates really stimulate further entrepreneurship and growth, for instance? And that's partly, we think, because of a lack of data on who innovates in America, who actually are the people who are doing the invention, the entrepreneurship, and so forth. We actually don't really know very much about them because we've lacked data traditionally on being able to look at the life trajectories of people who become inventors. So what we're going to do in this paper with my uh, colleagues Alex Bell, Neviana Petkova, John Van Rinian, and Xavier Jaravel is use big data to study who becomes an inventor in America. And the approach we take is to link three very different data sets that allow us to paint a quite comprehensive picture of inventors' life trajectories. The first is we start from publicly available patent records. We're going to use patents as a proxy for innovation. They're not a perfect measure of innovation by any means, but we think they do capture, for reasons I'll explain, uh, important aspects of innovation. And then we link that data, uh, working with people in the US Treasury who do this linkage uh, internally, uh, to information from federal income tax returns, where we can see things like kids' parental backgrounds, what their parents' incomes were, where they go to college, what their earnings are, and so forth. And then we bring in a third set of data from uh, the New York City School District, where we're able to look at, over a 20-year period, uh, information on test scores in elementary and middle school for all kids who went to New York City schools. And by linking these three data sets, we're able to have a rich database that really allows us to study uh, the lives of inventors and ultimately what types of policies might matter to increase innovation. So the way I'm going to organize the talk, the way we organized our thinking and analyzing these data is by it's basically a chronological approach, tracking inventors from birth to adulthood to understand the factors that determine uh, who invents. And so I'm going to start at the beginning by analyzing inventors' characteristics at birth with this chart here, which shows you patent rates versus parent income. So the way this chart is constructed is each dot represents one percentile of the parental household income distribution. And then we're plotting the number of kids who go on to become inventors in that income group per 1,000 children. So you can see that if you are born to parents below the median of uh, the US income distribution, less than one in 1,000 of those kids goes on to become an inventor by their mid-30s or so, which is when we're measuring uh, innovation rates. In contrast, if you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you're 10 times as likely to become an inventor as kids born to parents below the median. Now, this pattern holds not just for innovation in general, but also for the subset of very highly cited patents that have a big influence on scientific progress, on commercialization, on market values. So think of, for instance, the Google search algorithm, a very famous patent that obviously had a big impact. So if you look at the subset of highly cited patents and ask what fraction of kids go on to have a patent that really has a significant impact, they're in the top 5% of the citation distribution, uh, 
you see that you see an extremely similar pattern to what I showed you before. The reason this is important is because it suggests that there's a potential here for what we call lost Einsteins. What if these kids at the bottom of the income distribution innovated at the same rate as the kids who came from higher income families? We would have dramatically more uh, high impact patents that could change technology, change medical progress, change our lives in many ways. Now, before we jump to the conclusion that there are lost Einsteins and this is a problem we need to fix, I think it's important to ask from a scientific perspective, why do patent rates vary with parent income? And here it's useful to classify the set of possibilities into three potential explanations. So the first is what economists would call differences in endowments, or in this case, differences in ability. So perhaps it's the case that kids from higher income families, their parents must presumably have been talented to reach the top of the income distribution. Maybe they just have a greater ability to innovate. And so maybe that explains some of the gradient we're seeing. You know, that's an explanation we should at least consider seriously. A second possibility is that this is about differences in preferences. So a very natural uh, thing you might think of is that lower income kids, you know, maybe they'd have the opportunity to innovate if they want to, but innovation is a risky career, and as I'll show you some evidence of. Uh, and so if you come from a low income family, you might say, you know, I want to choose a safer path where I can support my family and so forth. I don't want to do this thing that has incredibly risky returns. A third possibility is that lower income kids have comparable talent and perhaps similar preferences, but maybe they just lack the resources or exposure to innovation or they face barriers to entry that prevent them from going into innovation. So why is it important to distinguish these three explanations? If it's the third story, there's a potential role for policy, there's a role for nonprofits, there's a role for us to do something about this problem in a way that, that could really make a difference. If it's the first two, it's a little bit hard to think about, harder to think about what you might do if people just want to do, uh, pursue different careers. You could think about things like reducing the amount of risk they face, but it would point you in a different direction relative to if we think this is about constraints. So with that structure, I wanna start by thinking about this first uh, possibility that this is about differences in ability. And this is where we're gonna bring in the information on test scores that we have from the school district data. So this chart here is showing you the same uh, vertical axis, Y axis as we had before, the number of kids who go on to become inventors, but now plotted not against parental income, but against math test scores in third grade. And the way this is constructed is each dot represents 5% of the test score distribution. So the first dot is the bottom 5%, the top dot's the top 5%. And you can see there's a very strong relationship between math test scores as early as third grade and probabilities of becoming an inventor. The future, the kids at the top of their third grade math class are much more likely to become inventors. So that's perhaps not surprising, it's intuitive. I mean, I think it does show you that these test scores, even at early ages, have quite a bit of predictive power, which is an important point in the context of the debate about standardized tests. What I think is of more interest in the uh, context of what we're talking about here is if you now split this data, looking at kids who come from relatively high income families in the top quintile of the income distribution in the orange, and kids who come from <coughs> lower income and middle income families in the blue below the 80th percentile, you see a very interesting pattern, which is that high scoring children are much more likely to become inventors if they're from high income families. If you're from a low income family in the blue and are at the top of your third grade math class, your probability of becoming an inventor of having a patent in your mid thirties doesn't look all that much higher than other kids. And so this fact, I think, really suggests that this can't be purely about differences in ability, because even among kids who appear to be quite talented in math uh, early in childhood, um, you see quite significant differences in rates of innovation. So to, so to put it differently, it, this, this data seems to suggest that in America, you need two things to become an inventor. You need to excel in math and science. You need to be smart in, in these fields and you need to come from a rich family. And that, of course, raises the possibility that there might be a significant number of lost Einsteins. There are a set of kids who could potentially come through the pipeline who are not uh, doing so. So that data was for kids, uh, was using data on test scores in third grade. Now, an interesting pattern you find, which I think illuminates what, what might be going on here, is if you ask uh, 
what fraction of the gap in innovation can be accounted for by differences in test scores for, uh, for kids in high income versus low income families? Turns out, if you look at the data that I was showing you before, the answer to that question is about 30% in third grade. Okay, and of course, third grade is not like the starting point. By the time you're in third grade, there have been quite different experiences for kids in low and high income families. So you shouldn't think of that as a pure measure of innate ability. But even given that, in third grade, <clears throat> you explain only 30% of the gap in innovation by differences in test scores. But now if you repeat that analysis and ask what fraction of the gap in innovation can you explain by differences in test scores in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and so on, you see that there's a steady progression over time. So basically what's happening here is that lower income kids are falling behind higher income kids in terms of test scores in school. And so by the time they get to, if you extrapolate out and think about the end of high school or college, if you were to look at test score performance at that time or other measures of uh, kind of ability at that point, you wouldn't be all that surprised to see much lower innovation rates among kids from lower income families relative to kids from higher income families. And what that suggests, once again, is that there's something happening. These kids are going along different paths, even though they started out with relatively similar abilities at the beginning, pointing not so much to the ability story, but to other possibilities. So uh, what I want to quickly show you next, before turning to what those other possibilities are, is that you find analogous patterns if you look at other um, dimensions of the data. So if you look at differences by race or by gender, you see quite similar gaps to what we saw by income. So this chart replicates the chart that I showed you before, now cutting the data by race and ethnicity instead of cutting the data by parental income. And you can see you know, really stark patterns here where among kids at the top of their third grade math class, once again, Asians and whites have quite high probabilities of becoming inventors, but black and Hispanic kids who are at the very, you know, performing at the same level in third grade just have much, much, almost zero probability of, of becoming inventors, illustrating the stark gaps by race and ethnicity uh, that we see in this context and many other contexts. Turning to gender, here we can look at how this has changed over time. So this is showing you the fraction of inventors who are female by the year in which they're born. And you can see that the gender gap in innovation in America is actually closing steadily over time. There are more and more female inventors over time. But if you look at the magnitude of that progression, we cu currently about 14% of patents uh, go, to, go to women. And every year, there's an increase of about a quarter of a percentage point. What that means is it's going to take another 118 years to reach gender parity in innovation, right? It's a very slow progress in terms of uh, gender convergence, just given the status quo. Once again, you know, that doesn't seem to be related to, to differences in ability. If you look at the set of kids who are scoring at the top of their third grade math class, much higher innovation rates if you're a boy than if you're, if you're a girl. So what I want to turn to next is, okay, so it doesn't seem like this is about uh, pure differences in ability um, or ta intrinsic talent. Uh, what might be going on here? So what we're going to do next is turn to what's going on in childhood and hone in specifically on the effects of childhood environment, thinking about childhood environment in a very particular way. So we're going to study the impacts of childhood environment by focusing on the effect of exposure to innovation during childhood through your family or through your neighbors. And so let's start once again by thinking about your own parents, analyzing the relationship between children's patent rates and their own parents' patent rates. So this simple chart here just asks, let's take the set of kids whose own parents were inventors who had a patent and the set of kids whose parents were not inventors. You can see that the kids whose parents were inventors are about 10 times more likely to have a patent themselves as the kids whose parents were not inventors. Now, that correlation could be driven by two very different mechanisms. It could be driven by genetics. So it could be that if your parents were good at innovating, you know, maybe you are as well. That seems intuitive. Or it could be about exposure. Maybe you're aware of careers in innovation. You pursue math and science. You are interested in technology because you grew up in a family where that was discussed at the dinner table and it's really like on your radar screen, something you're interested in. So how do we distinguish between these two very different explanations? So one of the key ideas of the paper is that we can isolate the causal effect of exposure by analyzing the propensity to patent 
in very narrow technology classes. Patents are classified into about 450 different technology classes, which are very fine, so amplifiers, antennas, uh, different fields in which uh, you can get a patent. And the intuition here is that your genetic ability to innovate is unlikely to vary across very similar technology classes, right? You'd be surprised if you have the amplifier gene as opposed to the antenna gene. Um, and so what we're going to do to operationalize that logic is uh, define the similarity of two technology classes based on the fraction of inventors who patent in both of those classes. So intuitively, you're going to see relatively few people patenting in biology and in computers. So those are going to get classified as being very far apart. But there are going to be more people who patent in one type of semiconductors and another type of semiconductors. That's going to get classified as being very close. Okay? So to give you a concrete sense of how this works, if we take, in this case, a particular technology class, pulse or digital communications, the next closest class is demodulators, then modulators, oscillators, and so forth. And basically, our logic is, you know, we don't think your genetic propensity to patent is going to be different for oscillators or modulators or demodulators. So we're going to see how your probability of inventing varies across these categories in relation to the field in which your father uh, had a patent, okay? And so this chart summarizes that finding. What we're showing here is the fraction of kids who invent in each field, where zero denotes inventing in the same field as your dad, and then one is the next closest technology, two is the second closest technology, and so forth. And what you see is a really striking pattern, which is that kids are much more likely to invent in exactly the same technology class as their parents, and not even the thing that's just one away. So if your dad invented a modulator, you're exactly, you know, you're more likely to invent a modulator and not even an oscillator or, you know, some other thing that's like super similar. So intuitively you would think like that's probably not about genetics. That's, you know, you were exposed to that field. Maybe you got an internship while you were growing up. You worked in a company that your parents connected to you or something like that. Um, and that gives you a flavor for what we think might be going on here in terms of the mechanism. So, you know, how does this tie into what I was showing you earlier about differences by income, differences by race and ethnicity? We think this type of exposure is much more likely to occur for high income white men simply because there are more high income white men who are inventors to begin with. It's kind of like a self reproducing process, right? So, now that's, I think, interesting evidence that gives you some sense of what might be going on looking at parents. But now coming more towards potential policy solutions. Parents, obviously, are not a very easily replicable source of exposure to, to innovation. So next, we're going to turn to a broader source of potential influence, which are your neighbors, the kind of community in which you're growing up. And we're going to examine patent rates here by commuting zone. So think of commuting zones as analogous to metro areas. They're aggregations of counties. Um, and we're going to look at the commuting zone where you grow up and see how that relates to your probability of becoming an inventor. So this map here shows you the origins of inventors in America. So for 740 different commuting zones, it takes the set of kids who grew up in that place and asks what fraction of those kids went on to become inventors. The dark blue colors are places where more kids went on to become inventors. The lighter colors, the white colors, are places where fewer kids went on to become inventors. We've labeled the top five cities in terms of producing inventors. Some of them might be intuitive, like San Francisco, San Jose, the Silicon Valley area. I think it's interesting that Detroit's on the list. In many of the other studies we've done on rates of upward mobility, Detroit is often at the bottom of those lists. In the context of innovation, Detroit's at the top. We think that might have something to do with the presence of um, auto firms and engineering and tinkering kind of in uh, Detroit that might change the exposure that, that kids have. And I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail in a second. One feature of the map I'll point out, so you see, you know, in the southeast, much lighter colors in general. Many fewer kids go on to become inventors. There's one notable exception to that. There's a blip in Texas where you see darker colors. What is that? That's Austin, Texas, um, where you see many kids growing up to become inventors. So you can kind of see an interesting pattern in this map, which is the places where kids are more likely to grow up to become inventors are the places where innovation is occurring. So if you grow up in a place like San Jose, you're much more likely to become an inventor yourself. So this is plotting 
kids in mention rates versus the patent rates of adults working in that area. If you grow up in a place like Brownsville, Texas, where there are very few people working in the innovation sector, you are much less likely to become an inventor yourself. So this is, again, consistent with the idea that exposure to innovation, this time not through your parents, but through your neighborhood more broadly, might affect rates of innovation. Now, once again, you might ask, how do we know that those differences across areas are actually driven by the effect of exposure? versus other differences across places. The people who live in Silicon Valley are really different from the people who live in Brownsville, Texas, or Atlanta, right? So you can't conclude just from that that exposure matters. So we're gonna take the same kind of approach of looking at these um, technolo technology class differences. And so rather than showing you the empirical econometric analysis here, I'm just gonna give you a simple example that summarizes the key finding. So let's say you've got two people who currently live in Boston. Let's say they're students at MIT. And suppose one of them is from Silicon Valley, and suppose the other is from Minneapolis, which is a medical device hub. There are a lot of medical device firms in Minneapolis. It turns out if you look at these two kids, the one from Silicon Valley is much more likely to patent in computers, and the one who grew up in Minneapolis is much more likely to have a patent in medical devices. And this is true not just at the level of computers versus biology, it's true again at that very fine technology class level that I was talking about before which really suggests that it's something about the environment in which you're growing up as opposed to other factors that are driving these differences. Now, moreover, one of the findings that I find particularly interesting here is that these patterns are gender specific. So what matters is not just the overall rate of innovation in your area, but the rate of innovation by people of the same gender. And so let me illustrate that in this chart. So the way to interpret this chart is suppose you move to an area, uh, move from an area that's at the 25th percentile in terms of rates of innovation for people of your gender to the 75th percentile. So you're moving to a place where you see more innovation among current workers. How would that affect the number of inventors? And we're gonna consider four different cases. On the left, we're gonna consider the effect of having more male inventors in your area on boys' probabilities of becoming an inventor. And you can see there's a quite significant impact there. The rate of innovation rises by 1.1 out of 1,000. Now, remember the average innovation rate in the economy as a whole is about two in 1,000 people become inventors by their mid-30s. So this is like a 50% increase. It's quite a substantial effect. In contrast, if boys grow up in areas where there are more female inventors, you don't see a, any statistically significant change in their probability of becoming inventors. Now let's turn to girls on the right-hand side. If girls grow up in areas with more male inventors, you see essentially no impact at all. In contrast, looking at this fourth bar, if girls grow up in an area where more women are inventing, you see really significant effects. So these exposure effects are not just technology class specific, they're also gender specific, which I think is important to think about as we uh, think about the mechanisms here and what potential policy solutions might be. Just to give you a different way to think about the magnitudes, if girls were as exposed to female inventors as boys are to male inventors, the gender gap in innovation in America would fall by half. So these exposure effects are quite important in magnitude. Okay, so <clears throat> the findings that I've been showing you here are consistent with other evidence that our research team has documented and others have documented that neighborhood environment and childhood really matters for kids' long-term success. But what I wanna stress here is that the differences across areas in the production of inventors is unlikely to be due to the mechanisms we usually talk about in that literature, which are about differences in the quality of schools or neighborhood resources and so forth, because these very specific exposure patterns by technology class and by gender, are they're too narrow for that. It's unlikely that there's a school in one place that helps you, you know, patent and amplifiers versus antennas, right, coming back to that example. And so it's more consistent with the idea that it's, this is about mentoring or role models or information changes in aspirations, things like that. So I want to show you one final piece of data, which is now turning to inventors' careers. Let's look at how, uh, what inventors' careers look like, in particular their salaries, basically, from the lens of wanting to understand how financial incentives might affect individuals' decisions to pursue innovation. So I'll start with just a very simple fact. So this is drawn from income tax records, looking at the income distribution of inventors on average, what's their average annual income between the ages of 40 and 50? 
And what you see is this distribution is incredibly skewed, as you might expect intuitively. The 99th percentile is 1.6 million. The median is only 114,000. So many inventors, you know, they do well, of course, relative to the average person in the economy, but they're not astronomically wealthy, but there are a small handful of people who make a tremendous amount of money in this sector. Now, what's interesting is if you ask who are those people making $1.6 million, if you relate that to the scientific impact of the patent as measured by citations, you know, how many other people in the field are basically building on your work, you find that um, this is showing mean annual income by the number of citations you have where you fall in the citation distribution. You see that um, most inventors with patents that are not well cited or moderately cited, they're earning salaries of around $200,000 or so on average. But then if you look at the set of people who have the extremely influential patents, the Google search algorithm kind of patent, those people are making more than a million dollars per year on average over you know, several decades. So these people are earning you know, more than, let's say, 20 or 30 million probably over their careers. So why is that fact interesting? I think that evidence suggests that changes in financial incentives, for instance, cutting top income tax rates or trying to provide tax subsidies for innovation, have relatively limited potential to increase quality weighted innovation in America. So what's the logic? There are basically two pieces to this argument. First, changes in financial incentives are unlikely to influence the star inventors who have the innovations that really transform society. Why is that? Those guys are already making more than a million dollars a year. You would think intuitively that if you make an extra 50,000 or 50,000 less because of a 5% change in the tax rate, you would not expect that to affect somebody's career choice in a, in a fundamental way. The second important point is that tax incentives by their nature can only affect the people who've had exposure to innovation, right? If there's this whole set of people who are not even thinking about going into a career in innovation to begin with, fiddling around with the tax rate is not going to uh, change, change what they end up doing. And so we think that also greatly dampens the potential impacts you're going to see through financial incentives. In contrast, we think that if we can find ways to change exposure to innovation, to increase exposure to innovation, we can have quite substantial effects. If women, minorities, and children from low-income families were to invent as at, the, at the same rate as high-income white men, the innovation rate in America would quadruple based on the data that I've been showing you here. So there's a big, you know, there's a lot at stake here. There's a lot we could potentially do. The key question becomes, how can we recover these lost Einsteins? And so we don't have a definitive answer to that question in this paper. I'm hoping that Reshma and Tony will tell us what to do on the panel that we'll have uh, after this. But let me just lay out the way that we're thinking about the problem. So I think it's useful to think about these things in kind of three steps, diagnosis, treatment, and ultimately evaluation. So in the context of diagnosis here, um, one of the things that I think is useful that emerges from this data is that we can identify uh, the women, minority, and low-income kids who are potential inventors at pretty early ages. You saw that in the simple test score data that I was showing you, and that wasn't even a very refined analysis. There's lots of other information that you can use at early ages to identify these kids who are prospective, you know, potential Einsteins. And so then you could then hone in on the subgroup of kids who are really underrepresented in innovation and try to help bring them through the pipeline. How might you go, go about doing that? Turning to the treatment phase, you know, that could be through tailored mentoring programs. What I mean by that is matching people in the right way. This might mean matching a girl with a successful female inventor in an area. It might mean matching uh, a black child with a uh, black inventor in their area and so forth through targeted internship programs, through programs like Girls Who Code, for instance, more broadly through expanding opportunities for kids uh, in these subgroups. And then finally, I think a really critical phase of this where we need to do more work in this space is to evaluate scientifically the impacts of these interventions. What exactly is the value added of various programs that people are trying in a treatment control kind of framework? We can use the data that we've assembled to test historically what are the impacts of the different efforts that have been tried. So I want to end by talking about uh, why I think this is an important moment, in particular in the United States, to be thinking about these issues. By showing you this chart here, which Ted mentioned in the introduction, this fading American dream trend. So what this chart is showing you, 
is the fraction of kids who earn more than their parents did at a comparable age based on the year in which they're born. You can see that back in 1940, it was a virtual guarantee that you were gonna achieve the American dream of moving up relative to your parents. 92% of kids born in 1940 earned more than their parents did. If you look at how this has evolved over time, it's steadily declined such that kids born in the 1980s who are entering the labor market today, um, their chances of achieving the American dream, it's basically a coin flip, 50-50, whether you're gonna do better than your parents. So what's underlying this trend? There are two things that are going on. There are lower growth rates, GDP growth rates in the US over the past 30 years or so than in the past. When you have less GDP growth, you're gonna have less opportunity basically to do better than your parents did. So that's about one third of what's going on. Two thirds of what's going on is that the way in which GDP growth has been distributed is very different today than it was in the past. In the past, we had much more equal growth across the income distribution. Today, as you know, much of the growth goes to people at the very top of the income distribution. As a result, fewer kids across the income distribution in the middle class and at the bottom end up doing better than their parents did. So basically the rise in inequality contributes to the fading American dream. So why do I mention this, the end of a talk on innovation? Usually people think about these two trends as two independent things, changes in inequality and changes in growth. And in fact, people think they're in tension with each other. Often the narrative is that in order to spark growth, we need to do things that might come at the cost of increasing inequality, like changing tax rates, you know, changing the amount of redistribution and so forth. So I think we have this conception, the, the equity efficiency trade-off, that there's a tension between these two things. And perhaps there is in many contexts. But I think what I'd like to say using these data is that in this context, it seems like tackling the problem of inequality of opportunities, reducing inequality, could actually be quite beneficial for growth itself because it allows us to bring more inventors through the pipeline and make those discoveries that ultimately spark growth. So I think in this, at this you know, critical juncture in the US where there's a lot of tension, a lot of polarization, I think this sort of unifying approach of thinking about equality of opportunities is benefiting us both in terms of fairness and in terms of economic growth is hopefully a useful lens to move the policy debate forward.